Welcome to another episode of the 209 Podcast. I'm your host, Angelina Martin. As we all know, homelessness is a crisis that's plaguing not only our nation, but our state and the 209 here locally. We see homeless camps along the freeway in our communities. And so this week, we're talking to District 2 Stanislaus County Supervisor Vito Chiesa about possible solutions to this problem. Special thanks to this week's sponsor, the City of Turlock Municipal Services. Now let's jump into the conversation. Vito, thank you so much for being here with us today. It's a pleasure to be here. I wanted to bring you in today because homelessness is a huge issue, um, not only in the 209, not only in Stanislaus County, but throughout California as a whole. And I think it's important to talk to our leaders about you know, what can be done, what's being done, and what should be done. You were elected in 2008, seated in 2009. During that time, how have you seen the, the homelessness issue grow here locally? So if you just go back and look at the point in time count, uh, probably over the uh, the 12 years that I've been seated, it's gone from about 1,000 to 2,100 was our latest point in time count. I know we're doing a better job now, but you're just seeing more and more. And there's a couple of different parts, components that I would usually refer to. There's people that have housing insecurity that maybe lost their job or they had a medical condition, and then there's the chronic homeless. And I think that's probably what we're gonna to refer to more today than the housing insecurity point. You mentioned that point in time count. I have the most recent one written down uh, for Stanislaus County. So this was counted in early 2020, so actually right before the pandemic really got going locally. 2,107 homeless individuals in Stanislaus County, um, 207 children, and then that's up 184 people from the year before. Just based on what you've seen, um, I know you mentioned chronic homelessness. What are some of the main contributing factors to, you know, this this issue that we see? We see camps on the side of the road, even on, you know, the side of the freeway. Um, so what's causing this really? So it's, it's a combination of factors, and I wish I could put my finger exactly on it, but we know that uh, housing prices, rent prices have gone through the roof now through this pandemic. It seems counterintuitive, but it's just the way it is. And so there's a lack of affordable housing as a first component. Obviously, drugs and alcohol uh, addiction problems have been a huge component. Then health, physical health, I was talking about when we were talking about the uh, housing insecurity. But then there's the, the mental health component of it that contributes to it. And some of that is uh, co-occurring disorder. Sometimes it's just because of it's drug-induced. But you, t you take those combination and you put everyone together and there's a, you know, it makes for not a good situation for some people. Yeah, what what services are available for for people who are, you know, either struggling with drug issues or mental health issues? Sometimes I know they go hand in hand. And do these people are they wanting help? Are they accepting the help? Or what what have you seen? Yeah, typically uh, our outreach and engagement team, which is out in these camps, at least a couple of times a month here in Turlock, and then they're they're here more often when they follow up with clients. But a whole host of services are offered, behavioral health and recovery, uh, the community service agency, which would be signing up for uh, CalFresh, which used to be welfare, uh, getting people ID. Sometimes there's a, a barrier to getting into the system because you don't have an ID. So those services are offered and even drug and alcohol treatment, but it's, it's a very small percentage. I think the last one I read where they were out of the camp by Planet Fitness, 30 people were engaged. Five of them took services to sign up for um, some sort of WIC program and or CalFresh, but only one took shelter. And th there are shelter, there is shelter available for them, uh, th but it's hard to see. And uh, I like to talk about the three components of really what makes up uh, uh, a solution or at least a part of the solution. And that, you know, shelter and housing is the first component because you have to stabilize people. And it doesn't matter if it's a low barrier shelter or if it's transitional housing. The second po component of that is services, right? You want to be able to provide behavioral health and recovery services, uh, community service agency, maybe it's just physical health, they're ill and they need some help in that component. And then the third part of that is accountability, it's enforcement. And you can't just do enforcement, you can't just provide services, you can't just provide shelter. It's like the three-legged stool and it falls down without one or the other. Something we've seen a lot in recent years, especially in Turlock, um, we were out you know, at a homeless encampment underneath the uh, First Street 
overpass, I believe it is, um, you know, headed out toward yep. Golden State Boulevard and Turlock a couple of years ago. And, and that was a situation where we saw Stanislaus County come in and actually, you know, remove the camp. And we see it year after year, these these camps form and then they're they're removed and the the people who are camping just kind of move to a different spot. Do you think that this this method is is working? Do you think that, <laughs> yeah, like what, yeah. what can be done about that? So I can tell you what I've seen in Modesto and Turlock doesn't have a low barrier shelter, but uh, originally the Modesto police chief, Galen Carroll, uh, they were starting to camp in all the parks. So the, if you're familiar with the Boise decision that doesn't allow you to move people out of public space, there's not enough uh, beds which is the case pretty much in anywhere in Stanislaus County. So the Boise decision really changed the way we handle things and not allowing. But conversely, when, when Moe's opened the Modesto Outdoor Shelter, uh, it allowed the police to, to send people to a single location where services were provided. Then when Moe's went away, the um, low barrier shelter that's at the Barbarian Center ran by the Salvation Army was created. And it's it's been a... a good transitional step because until you have people in a in a stationary environment where it's a secure environment from them they won't take services and that's why we've not had any success typically on the street and here we've been moving people around caltrans right away to up right away to turlock right away to county right away we keep moving them around and that's not a final solution we know that i also want to shout out to the we care and the gospel mission who are doing great work. I never want to minimize it. Uh, the people of Turlock are so generous and they're doing great work. Uh, there just needs to be a little more. Modesto has made headway on on this issue with the low barrier shelter. And, you know, they even provided that, that out, outdoor camp that you had mentioned. And like you said, I'm sure um, people were connected to services through both of those means. Is there anything in the works like that for Turlock? I know that um, quote unquote tent cities have been discussed and even brought up at city council meetings. Um, and I know Turlock's not the whole two and I, but it's a very, um, it's a place where you can get a very good visual of this problem. So, yeah. so if you look at the point in time count, Modesto has 75% of the homeless and they're 39% of the population. So no matter how bad it looks down here, the situation in Modesto was much worse. And I would tell you that if I walk around downtown, there used to be uh, where our office is at 10, 10, 10 Street, uh, there were a lot more folks in distress. I call them in distress. There were panhandlers too, but a lot of people that were really uh, struggling. And since they've opened the low barrier shelter, the people that I see that are homeless downtown are working for the downtown streets team and picking up garbage. It's been a real transformation in the urban core. It doesn't mean that they're not along the Tuolumne River and Dry Creek and other places. So, but there's been progress in, in that. Uh, so a, a couple of things just off the top of my head, there's a CARES team and a community assessment response and engagement. And Turlock had one. And then when they went through the um, tough budget times, I think they'd pulled off uh, their officers off of that. And I, I, at their last council meeting, I was pleased because they're trying to reinstitute that. And the, the CARES Act is a combination of people. And so what they do is they do an assessment. And, and after they've done an assessment, they identify what I consider a frequent flyers. And again, the people that are in the most distress who are utilizing the most services, whether that's the, uh, you know, the institutionalized for, for 72 hours through BHRS, or uh, you, might, you might see them, you know, screaming on the side of the road. So they had determined that rather than at $1,200 a night, it's better for us to send out a behavioral health specialist, a, a nurse, a firefighter to go find those people two or three times a week, make sure they're taking their medications, uh, making sure they're connecting to family if possible. And you, know, you can't stop them from doing things they want to do, but if you keep them on a uh, more even keel, uh, you have less interactions with police, with fire, and those are where the real costs uh, are run up. So, um, so my point is that the CARES Act, we had to pause it because of COVID, and COVID has really put a dent in a lot of actions over the last 12 months. But the CARES Act is funded through uh, the Community Corrections Partnership, 
which came with AB 109 when they realigned prisoners down to the local level. And that's been a part of the problem, too. But as they realigned them back to the local level, they gave us some funding. They redirected sales tax funding. So they're going to go with the CARES Team 2.0, which is going to be countywide. Everyone has to have a little skin in the game, which means you, you offer up some police officers and or firefighters. But I, I think that hitting those most distressed people really take a lot of pressure off of business and the public. Yeah, and it sounds like maybe um, people have seen things get worse in Turlock along or, you know, coinciding with those budget issues that removed the the CARES team um, from going out and making contact with those people. Is that kind of right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's it has it has a detrimental effect. I think it's it's more obvious now, again, for, for a whole host of reasons, unemployment, uh, people are unemployed, and it just we've kind of hit the tsunami now, but we got to deal with it. No matter how you look at it, moving them around, as you were talking about earlier, doesn't doesn't create an atmosphere where people can get better. And I, even if it's only five or ten percent of the people to get better, you think of taking those off rather than going up ten ten uh, percent on our point in time count. If we keep it flat or we can start reducing it, then then that's been success, or that that can be seen as a success. So when we see um, areas like a camp on county land that the county comes out and move moves these people from or you know um, railroad property like along uh, first street or over by taylor road off highway 99 or even you know city land like we see next to the planet fitness on west main street if any of our listeners have visited turlock and come down that road you know it's really hard to miss it's one of the largest camps i've ever seen in turlock and i've lived here my whole life um when, when those people are moved out, what is the expectation of them? Is it is it expected that they'll just move to a different spot? or? I think that right now that is what you see, not not just here, not yeah. just in Turlock, but just about everywhere when a camp's broken down. People, uh, the there's not enough shelter space generally. Uh, the people don't seem to like Tent City, so you still have to have some sort of, because the, the greatest barrier to entry if you talk to the homeless folks is that pets possessions and partners right you got to separate the men from the women yeah and families want to stick together we we do have a few options that have opened up in the last year on ninth street we took one of the hotels right by hatch road i think there's 21 units and we've served 46 families in the last year and 80 percent of those people have ended up in permanent housing so when you have someone stabilized, but we've done this with families, remember they've gotten priority over, um, especially single males, uh, you, you give them intensive case management, you give them the tools to be successful, whether that's workforce development, your ch- some workforce training, whether that's drug and alcohol rehab, you help them get to their doctor's appointments and you get them mentally ready, physically ready, and, and then we've been able to transition. We also have the Empire Migrant um, Camp, it's, it was a summer camp for migrant labor, and we've been utilizing about a third of the, the apartments. I think there's 22, and we've been putting families in there under the same scenario, and we have about an 80% success rate, again, transitioning out. When you look at the whole housing paradigm, shelters are only a part of that, and you, people have to move beyond that. Shelters aren't for the long term. You've got to have transitional housing. Uh, in Modesto, the housing authority had just purchased the old um, Motel 6 that's on Kansas Avenue. It's called the K-House Transitional Houses, a couple of hundred rooms there. And and so you want people to move on. You want them to be employable. And so we're, we're seeing success. There's just not enough success overall. I think when you mentioned things like that, like turning a hotel into, you know, a, a temporary housing for, for those who are houseless or you know, a low bar- building a low barrier shelter, building more affordable housing, sometimes there tends to be pushback from, from the community. Um, what would you say to the community of, about those efforts? Because it seems like if, if this is something that we want to fix, those are necessary expenditures and necessary things that we need in our communities if we don't want camps. So I liken this to, you know, it's a nationwide program, it's a California program. But the bottom line in Stanislaus County, it's a local program, or problem. I keep saying program. Yeah. <laughs> it's a local problem. We can't, uh, you know, people are not bussing them in. 
Uh, we're not bussing them out. People are tr uh, transient by nature, uh, percentage of them. So it's we have to deal with it. And whether we say regionally, it's Stanislaus countywide, but doing nothing is not an option. It seems like that's what we're uh, doing in some cases. There's been a lot of progress. We're putting about $4 million more million into behavioral health and recovery services this year. Out of our general fund, there's the CARES Act funding that runs through. So Stanislaus County got $22.7 million of CARES Act corona, coronavirus aid relief. Emergency? Emergency, there you go. Services? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I'm, I'm guessing now, but you did I, really well. I use, I use acronyms all day long, yeah. so when I have to actually tell you what the acronym is. So the, the CARES Act funding is going through the Community Systems of Care, and, and then there's the SHAW, the Stanislaus Housing Alliance. Uh, your member from the council, uh, when it started out, because it's been in effect about 18 months, first it was Mayor Bublak, then it was council member Nasrati, and now it's Councilwoman Mones sits on there. And they're the ones, so the community systems of care, all the money, state and federal money flows through the community systems of care, which is made up of a lot of community-based organizations and um, some county staff. But the Shaw, the Stanislaus Housing Alliance, which is made up of generally elected officials, they're going to determine where that money goes. Uh, the We Care Shelter got about a half million dollars. So 10 million was set aside for emergency shelter operations. Of that, uh, We Care got about a half million and the Gospel Mission got about a million. That's just to operate it. So this is a, a big plus when I talk about how great the community has been and how generous this will make it easier to operate. Uh, with less stress. And then there's, uh, I think, about $7 million set aside for a, an increase in capacity in current. It's, they can't build a new shelter, but you could expand on a current shelter. I think there's an opportunity for the Salvation or, or uh, the Gospel Mission looking for an opportunity to do maybe some transitional housing. They're talking uh, with that. And then $2.2 million is set aside for the streets team. $2.2 million is identifying. Uh, uh, people with issues and a little bit for administration. So uh, of that money, they've only spent a little bit of it and they're going to claim as they operate. It's on a per bed uh, countywide. So th that's a good thing. The second component of money, there's the $1.9 trillion um, CARES Act 2.0, I would call it, that's coming through. And the good news is before last time, all the money, it was $92 million given to Stanislaus County, of the original 92 million, we gave 15 million to the cities, but that was pretty much to make up for lost revenue, because everyone has, you know, seen a drop in revenue. They did see it right away last um, March, April, May. In this bill, there's about 85 million for cities in Stanislaus County, and about 102 million maybe for Stanislaus County to operate. So those can go to business relief grants, those can go to rental assistance, those can go to behavioral health to pump it up. CARES Act, I mean, your, your CARES Act team there locally, outreach and engagement, there's ways to pump up uh, what is already being done. So, and besides that, there's going to be money to be utilized for homelessness in there. Uh, we haven't gotten any allocation, we don't know what that's going to be, but I, I, at least there's an opportunity in the short term well, again, families are in more distress and people are in more distress to try and deal with it. But in the end, you can't force someone without, you know, because of the Boise decision until you have enough shelter beds, you can't force people to get off of public property. That's a, a lot of money that you just mentioned. And um, I was looking back and there was a report given to the Board of Supervisors in December of 2020 that said about $34 million has been um, used throughout different programs over the, the last two years um, to, to help this homeless problem. So, you know, 34 million, there's more, millions more coming. And obviously you've just spoken to us about all of these different services that this money is going towards, but I think that people expect kind of a, a quick fix. I don't know, I don't know what kind of quick fix that is, whether it be, I, I don't know, honestly, um, so what what do you think could be done to kind of calm the public? Because I, 
I see during city council meetings, business owners calling in and, you know, complaining that they've been burglarized or you see, you know, on the police scanner um, robberies nearby these homeless camps. So what do you think can be done short term to, if anything? So I, I, I believe, again, stabilizing people. So shelter beds, making sure you have enough shelter beds, the services will be provided when you get someone stabilized. I've seen 6,000 people went through the access center next to the low barrier shelter. And that's not just for homeless people, that's for people in danger of being homeless, people who need help, again, whether it's rental assistance, um, physical, mental health. I mean, I repeat the same things all over, but if you, if, if you ask someone in a homeless encampment where they would go get services, they don't know. When you have them in a shelter situation in We Care or in the Gospel Mission, and there's a social worker that's present there during the day, they can get them into one, any one of the avenues that are necessary. And it's, you know, I, I've been out with the, I went out with Councilman Nasrati with the uh, outreach and engagement team here in Turlock, and I see the difficulty. And, and being able to force people in and until we have enough shelter beds, it's hard to do the enforcement component, not if they're doing something illegal. But in California, uh, most drug charges now are misdemeanors. Uh, sometimes they're sight and release on the spot. Sometimes they get booked. But it, it made it tough. Yeah. And, and people, the, the AB 109 crowd, uh, AB 109 was the realignment. You know, the idea was that people get connected back with their families faster because when you're in state prison and you're in Pelican Bay or you're somewhere far away, your family members can't visit. So it makes sense. It, it makes logical sense to have people serve the last couple of years here in our local jail, but they typically are released here. And so we have to try and deal with it through services as best we can. Drugs, we need more drug and alcohol beds as a starting point. Very difficult to find them, but that would be a, a very much a starting point so we can force people in through the courts. That's, there's some avenue there with drug charges and mental health services. Uh, just, you know, there's a shortage of psychiatrists, psychologists, everywhere in the Central Valley, just like doctors. We're short on doctors. I know um, a couple of years ago, Laura's Law went into effect here in Stanislaus County. Have you been kind of keeping up with the, the progress of that and if that's helped any? Yeah, we're supposed to get a report and they, um, nobody's actually made it all the way through the system. There's the black robe effect, right? Where people have to go before a judge, but the judge doesn't have any power to order someone. But again, you have it seems that more family surrounds their family when the court is involved. So I'm hearing there's better outcomes, but they haven't reported out because they wanted to do a full year. And then it takes them a few months to put the statistics together. But I think uh, we'll extend that. That was a pilot program, but it looks like it's having a net benefit. Um, and for those who don't know what Laura's Law is, could you kind of explain so, to them? Yeah, Laura's Law is another step. And when you're pushing people who are... I always have a hard time coming up with a word that's proper besides distress, people that are in more distress. And you can force them to the next step because you either make it into a locked facility, you're a 5150, and they can uh, keep you for 72 hours. And so people keep rotating in and out, but maybe they're not so sick that they have to be conserved. That's the, uh, the final step. So there's something called Laura's Law where you can force people into an added, uh, again, they get before a judge. And I can just tell you, uh, it's the black robe effect. Getting before a judge is one more um, indicator for them that they're on the wrong path or that they really have an issue. And so, again, people start in that path, but no one has made it before a judge because people have turned the right direction as they're working through this process. They realize, they, you know, there's, a, there's an assumption they're going to end up in jail. And that's just not the case. But again, anything we can do to force people or get them to think that they need treatment and they need to sustain the treatment. District 2 is the Stanislaus County District you represent. We know that's uh, Turlock, Houston. When working with city leaders, um, especially in Turlock, that's probably the, I would say, the city that is dealing with it the most in your district, right? Yeah. Um, I feel like we hear a lot from city leaders that 
you know, it's it's a county problem. And then we hear from the county that the county is just waiting on the, the city to come up with some sort of plan. So what are what are those conversations like and how do you guys try to work together to come up with solutions? Yeah. So uh, great. Uh, when they opened up Mo's and Modesto, the county had tried twice to site a low barrier shelter and to to say that it was unwelcome uh, would be an understatement. Uh, the city needed to determine what success looks like for them. The county is very good at funding. Uh, money flows through the county from the state and federal government uh, more so, although CARES Act 2.0 is going to change that to some degree, but most of the time the money flows through the county. So we want to be a good partner and with a plan, but Again, a plan of moving people around isn't much of a plan. So um, I think there's an opportunity to expand or to, to do some things over at the Gospel Mission. Uh, I'm, I'm just so impressed with the giving of this community and how much they've done. United Samaritans, the, the list goes on and on and on. I, I think, and, and Marin Pitt, what she's done at Avina Bella, I don't think people understand how hard it is to cobble money together to do some some low-income housing, transitional housing, and uh, those types of projects. And she's been absolutely awesome to work with. And she's on the, uh, the community systems of care too. So I, I, I look forward to, to continuing the conversation and finding a solution. Again, I will you know, hunt for money, I will find money, but uh, again, it's not until Turlock determines their direction, uh, it's, the county's not going to tell them how to do it. That's, that never goes over very well. Yeah, and I know there's more um, low income and transitional housing in the works in Turlock, so that's that's good news. Uh, we have been covering this homelessness issue in our city for going on, you know, three and a half, four years now. And you know, my colleague and I, we've gone out to camps, we've spoken to people, people that we've spoken to have died since then. And a, a lot of what we asked, um, you know, our leaders, like our police chief, um, our mayor at the time, do you think that there is a solution to this? Um, do you think it can be fixed? Or do you think that this is just something that will always be? Well, th there's going to be, as long as there is a Boise decision, there's always going to be a problem because you can't build so much uh, shelter beds, it's, that's not where you want to spend all of your money. You need shelter beds, like I mean talking about low barrier, but you need to move the people up and out and, and it takes a job again and when they have problems along the way we need to be there to help them. Again, relapses, drug, alcohol, methadone clinics, I mean I think of those things totally unpopular but necessary. And, and I talk like, you know, I'm, I have come from a farming background and we're pretty tight conservative people generally but I understand there's you go out and talk to the folks it's not that easy you know when I sit and is it's easy for me to judge them but some of these people have it was a it was a medical condition that they ended up there and then when you're when you're out there and you're cold and you're lonely then you do methamphetamines or heroin or something and very addictive drugs so uh, again there, there has to be some self-responsibility, there has to be some enforcement, but we have to start the transitional and then build through the paradigm of housing to low-income housing to what you were speaking of. And that's really where the shortage is, uh, that if we, could, if we could move people through the system, but there's no place to move them. I will also tell you that the um, Stanislaus County Housing Authority has done a lot of great work around, and they're, they're real leaders as far as I'm concerned. I like to, to fund them. And the the housing vouchers there's housing vouchers for rapid re, um rapid rehousing vouchers or get someone into a hotel room for a week and it and or section 8 housing and section 8 housing is subsidized by the government but getting landlords to accept section 8 housing vouchers is very difficult so we haven't lost any vouchers but there's the potential in the future the way we're headed uh, that that we could have vouchers unused. That's not the case today. I don't want anyone to think that. And, and so the, the, here, I'm going to flip to the next conversation is rental assistance. Currently, uh, Stanislaus County and the city of Modesto, they got a direct allocation. We're doing a rental assistance, which will pay up to 100% of your arrears in rent, utilities. Utilities include gas, electric, and internet service. And it's open right now at... 
www.stanrentassist.com. That's uh, S-T-A-N-R-E-N-T-A-S-S-I-S-T dot com. And so there's two allocations there. 18 million, no, yes, about $18 million. Scratch that, $16 million is the county program and the city of Modesto that are running the same. And that is 100%. And then when we run out of money, the state comes in and backfills another $17 million. So it's about 33 total. And that only pays 80% of the arrears, uh, just so people know. So, and the reason the county is doing 100% in the arrears is because it's so hard to find people because we don't have big corporations with big rental with you know, 100, 200, 300 units. We have a lot of um, families that have one or two rentals. And we want them to stay in the market. So we're trying to show good faith on a go-forward basis. How do you qualify for that? What's the rem or what do you have to fall under? Is it for people that have just been impacted by COVID? Or? So uh, there's uh, when you go on a stand assist, you can't have any more than 80% of the area median income. And they're giving preferential treatment if you're at 50% of the area median uh, income. And that changes. We have the sliding scale depending on how many family members are in the house. And... Uh, again, it's it's something, and there's going to be more money coming. And I can tell you the need is there because it was open on a Thursday and the following Friday, so it was about eight days in the morning, we had over a 1,000 applications. So I expect to have thousands of applications, but yet uh, $32 million, $33 million is going to go a long ways towards paying, get, again, getting people on their feet so that because when you have that hanging over your head, yeah, it's it's hard to get out of it. We've spoken about the organizations that are doing great things in the community and, and doing their best to, to help these people and give back to these people. Um, but you just mentioned a lot. There's there's landlords who won't take Section 8. Um, there's people who don't want a low barrier shelter in their neighborhood. Um, what do you feel like the overall consensus of this area is towards the homeless? Do you feel like there's kind of an animosity there? I, I don't, I think it's the same in every, I saw the discussions in Modesto uh, with their council, with their, and if it wasn't for their police chief directing people to Beardbrook Park, he's the one that was really the impetus that uh, started the conversation. And I, animosity is a tough word. Everyone, NIMBY lives well <laughs> in just about everything. It doesn't yeah. matter what it is, but it it's life. So I would offer up, I would offer the people are here, right? They're not going to leave. We're not bussing them out. We're not bussing them in. The point in time count shows me every single time, 85% of the people, 80% uh, first became homeless in Stanislaus County. And then there's about another 5% between Merced and San Joaquin County. And then you add the two counties to the west that touches Santa Clara and Alameda that touch Stanislaus County. And it makes up 90%. So, so there, I think six of them had come from San Francisco, but I hear that a lot in the community. And that's just not the case. So it's a local problem. I remember how I talked about national, uh, you know, state, but it's a local problem. We need to deal with it locally. And, you know, moving them from Ceres to Turlock isn't the right way to do it. Moving them from Turlock to Modesto isn't the right way. Everyone has to step up. And, again, I don't, I can't tell the council because I'm, you know, again, uh, county supervisor, but I, I want to be a good partner. We want to fund it. We want to help fund it uh, as much as we can. And we just need to sit down and again, there's, you're not talking about a lot of beds, but you're talking about the housing spectrum, building more housing, whether it's at the top end of the housing market, all the way down to the, uh, your transitional housing, uh, which would be smaller are all important because even the top end is short, but we should start right now with the you know multifamily type uh, units where do you think that rumor comes from that people are bussed in is it just you know one person happens to talk to one person who came here sure. on a bus and it's born from that or there, there are people that are moved around i i can think of some stories stanislaus county when when you're in a shelter and you're stable do you have family members is one of the questions and where are your family members and they make contact and we've put people on a bus to go with their family and in, in LA or in Monterey and it's the same way some of them are, are again are just moving on their own so when when that story comes around I think uh, the point in time count they interviewed 
I think it was about 1,400 of the 2,100. And out of that, you, know, you have percentages uh, that I was telling you about. And I think six came from San Francisco. If there was one place you want to hang out as a homeless person, if you want services, it's in San Francisco. They spend more per capita. They have more services available. The weather's not bad. And, but it just shows you people aren't, aren't moving. They typically are from this area or close to this area, right, the adjoining counties. And, so, and, and it's a two-way street. As we have, again, sent some people out of the county, uh, people have sent folks in where family members are. So it's just not, that's, that's a shrew. It's nice to say that. Uh, and it makes people, you know, I, I guess feel better, but that's just not the case for the vast majority. Is it factual that the more services you offer, the more homeless people you're going to have? I see that on, on the Facebook comments a lot saying, you know, that the, the Central Valley offers all these services and that's why people come here. I have heard from no one that we <laughs> offer too many services. Okay. Uh, so I'm Glad, glad to hear someone thinks that, but we do not <laughs> offer. It's just, it's a shortage of services. Again, most uh, think of the discretionary spending of cities and the county are based largely on sales tax and property tax. And we have lower sales tax and lower property tax just about anywhere, you know, in the state, the Bay Area. That's why they can spend so much in in San Francisco, city and county of San Francisco, because think of a building that's 100 stories high or 50 stories, whatever it is, versus our two-story building that we're sitting in right now. It's just a different property tax with uh, the same impact, same types of impact. So it, uh, I just I don't, I don't buy into that either because I hear just the opposite. Most people are clamoring for more services. Obviously, it's a state issue. Do you make it up to the Capitol a lot to, to work these things out and, and get even more funding? Or So we try, and now with COVID, because COVID has changed even the the capacity of the uh, of all these shelters. Yeah. You can't put as many people in. And But there's money available through Project Home Key, which we're trying to purchase potentially another hotel to convert it. I mean, there's things we can do, but most of our meetings are through Zoom now. And, and I think that rental assistance, the state has a rental assistance program also. I think you're going to see a lot of help there because they, they keep pushing off the eviction moratorium. Yeah. So they have to deal with, because the landlords, you know, they've put the landlords in an awful spot at this point because they're, some of them are still making payments and they're in the same situation. So here's a chance for um, not only the renters to cure, but for the uh, landlords to reap some sort of you know payback. So Vito, if you could run to your desk right now and get started on one solution that could help fix this homelessness crisis, not only here in Turlock, here in your district, but you know the 209 as a whole, what would it be? <sighs> I think we need to do more regional planning on housing and a region. Measure E was passed by the voters back in 2008 that precludes any housing out in the unincorporated area that wasn't zoned already. So you see Denaire, just a little bit of growth in Denaire, but it's almost all taken up. And the same thing with Keys, uh, some of those unincorporated communities. But by and large, you can't really grow without a vote of the people. So, and, and I understand and I agree with the premise, you're trying to push the houses into cities. And those impacts, you know, if you are the city councilman in Houston, you may think differently than a city council person in, in Turlock. But ARENA, the regional housing numbers that were given to everyone, they kind of would tell you in what platitudes you're supposed to build houses. You're supposed to have 5% of your houses in low, very low income, and, and you work your way up because single-family homes are the most profitable for builders, and it still comes down without a state or federal subsidy. It still comes down to economics. If you're going to build a house, nobody's going to go through all that work without making a profit, and nor do I blame them. But as a, as a region, if we determine that we're going to do that maybe there is a the potential funding mechanism through the state or the federal government if we did it on a regional basis not forcing all the low-income housing into turlock and all single family you know on 10,000 square foot lots in houston or denair that's not that's not fair and but i think if we had that regional discussion that how we want to do it i think we'll be much better off because then we can figure out the funding mechanism to help support the low-income housing uh, that, that is built at not a, uh, the same profitable level.
Well, Vito, like I said before, you know, all we can do is look to our local leaders to help solve some of these issues. And it seems like you are doing your best to do just that. If there's community members who want to reach out to you, if they have, you know, ideas for solutions or they, they want to ask you a question, um, how can they do that? So you can either, my email is kiesav, C-H-I-E-S-A-V, at stancounty.com, S-T-A-N-C-O-U-N-T-Y.com. My office number is 525-6440. And I look forward to hearing if anyone has a solution. Uh, I'm always looking, and I, I feel like sometimes I get negative because we keep trying things that haven't been successful, and someone will call with the same idea. But there's always a new twist on it that might be successful, so you, you need to look into it. I also, if I leave you with one last thought, with the CARES Act 2.0, uh, with with the cities getting some money this time, and, and some of it will be for budget issues, I think Turlock's really poised in a good situation with Measure A passing. I think that takes care of some of that, and they're expected to get about $15 million in its current form. It's not through all of Congress yet. And again, Modesto, I think it's about $45 million. But there's probably a chance for us to, to put money together and have a multiplier effect on some of these issues that are, have been dogging us for a long time, because funding has always been an issue. Uh, everyone between you know the uh, the public pensions and health care costs and everything else that everyone's going through has really strapped government generally and and finally I see a path out right now again I'm not saying that we need another two trillion dollar plan because it's it's fake money right now but we we can put some money to good use and maybe jumpstart uh, some of these things we've been talking about and of course, we do know that this is not only a local issue, but it's a statewide issue. It's a nationwide issue. And we appreciate so much the work that you are putting in to help solve this crisis. And we really appreciate you coming on the 209 podcast to talk to us about it. Well, thank you very much for having me. Again, this is not an easy subject. There is no silver bullet. But again, as long as we continue to dialogue, uh, we're going to make things better. That's what we need to do incrementally, incrementally make things better. Well, thank you again, Vito. We appreciate it. And hey, we'd love to have you back maybe for a future episode um, if this if this problem gets solved or maybe if it's not as big of a problem here locally down the road. If you want to listen to more episodes of the 209 podcast, head over to 209magazine.com, Spotify, iTunes, or any other podcast platform.